My name is Chris Little. I am the host of the Lifestyle Chase Podcast. This is Season 5. All right, so welcome back to the Lifestyle Chase Podcast. Every single time I've done an episode lately, I've been like, it's been a while since the last episode. Things are busy. But it comes with good reason. It's just sometimes you have to sort of pause to refocus and reground and kind of decide what conversations you truly want to talk about and who you really want to talk to. And that is what brings us to bringing Enrico Incarnati onto the show. Did I butcher your name or did I get it? That was money. That was perfect. Sweet. Awesome. How are you today? I am well, man. Thank you. Before this episode started, so anyone listening, I had to reschedule this with Chris twice, I believe two or three times, mainly because my girlfriend and I were in Connecticut. And one time was we lost power completely and then lost it again. And uh, it just so happened like when we rescheduled that like it just didn't work. And I'm like, each time I did it, I'm like, I promise you this is a legitimate reason. I'm not trying to get out of this. Yeah, um, yeah. But nonetheless, I'm excited to be here, man. No, it's it's good because like I think that's sort of like the human aspect that we forget about this industry and going after goals is like everybody's a human at the end of the day, yep. despite how ambitious and competitive and all these things that we may be or how much drive we may have. We got life things outside of work. Like we got stuff that comes up, power goes out, traffic problems happen. And I definitely understand all that stuff. So happy to accommodate. One thing that I want to make sure that we tackle is I know who you are, but some of my audience might not. So how do you introduce yourself these days? That's a great question. So I introduce myself as Enrico Incarnati. I am a social media strategist and a videographer. Um, Cause I originally started as a videographer and now I've more so branded into being social media strategist, audience growth strategist, and just content overall. And you got a really cool origin story. It was fun because I was able to kind of go through your episode with both Andrew Coates and Beverly Simpson. And so what I like is just kind of like finding what you were truly like interested in rather than kind of like finding what you felt might be like the, the standard path to follow. So tell us a little bit about that sort of origin story. Just kind of paint a picture of like who you have been in the past. Yeah, so I love that. And Andrew is a phenomenal person and Beverly also as well. So thank you also for the connection with Beverly. So long story short, but glad we have time on here. I never wanted to be a videographer, never wanted to be anything to do with social media whatsoever. I actually wanted to become a pediatrician. And this all started back in high school when I was around 16, 17 years old. And I actually had gotten more into the medical field at 17 because that's when I became a certified nursing assistant. And I got my license and everything through school. And it was more of my father's thing. It, it morphed into more of my father's thing than my thing. And that's important for the, like later on, I wanted to go down the medical route because I looked at it as like, you know what? This is three, $400,000 salary secure. It's safe. It's something that's predictable. And it's something for me that it's a title. It's a level of prestige that I can achieve. And, you know, I can brag about and like, oh, my father be like, you know, like my son's a doctor and everything. And, you know, I was 17, like I mentioned, and you know, whenever I would see my father's friends, they would always refer to me as like Enrico the doctor. And I'm like, I'm 17, I'm 17, 18, going on 18. I'm like, I'm nowhere near a doctor, not even close. And it, it slowly became this overwhelming thing of like, I have to live up to this expectation of I have to be a doctor. I have to be like the, this perfect student. And it just, it, it felt like a mold that I was just jamming myself in that never felt right. Like it was jamming that circle into a, you know, square hole per se. And so 18 years old came and, you know, it was my final year of high school. And that's when I enrolled in like, you know, anatomy and physiology classes, honors chemistry, like advanced placement chemistry, and like the, the classes you needed to look good on a college resume then for when you applied to the health sciences. And so that's what I did. I pursued health sciences at DePaul University in Chicago and loved that school. I realized it just wasn't for me. And after the first year is kind of when I was like, this doesn't really feel like my thing. And I had revisited chemistry again, was doing lab. I remember I had labs on Monday night and I would bring my gym bag with me to class because I'm like, I'm going to go to the gym afterwards and just go work out. And that's when I really started falling more in love with fitness. And I, you know, became introduced to Christian Guzman, who is the owner of Alpha Lead Athletics, Max Tuning, who is the owner of Sour Strips, the candy company right now and ever forward. And I liked the path that they were going down. And it was two different paths. 
Christian left college. Max was, you know, he went to college and was working a nine to five, but made this YouTube thing, this content, social media thing work. I was more attracted to the Christian side, which is why I resonate with him more. And I'm like, I want to be able to do that. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I don't really resonate with this college thing. Not, not that I wanted to be rebellious or like say screw college or anything. It just didn't work for me. And it just wasn't the thing that I wanted to do. And one thing that I realized, and I think this will be important for a lot of people listening is, and, and I realized this early on, right? Like I was, I was 19 years old now and I'm like, I'm not going to be a doctor until 11, 12 years from now. Like that's a long time. Not only that from a time investment, but from, an, from a financial, I'm like, I still have to pay for medical school and I want to become a pediatrician. I have to do a residency on top of like, I have to do so many more things. I looked at that as like, what if I use this time now to kind of figure out other things, right? And what really resonated with me was at the time, Gary Vaynerchuk made a post that was, it, it went like this. It was, I'd rather you take the next two to three years, not pleasing your parents, doing what you want to do versus the next 80 years resenting them because you did what they wanted you to do. And that was powerful for me because that just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was like, I'm, that's me. Like he's speaking to me. You know, when it, whenever you see content and you feel called out on it and you're, you kind of feel like, you know, nowadays people are, you know, whenever they get called out, they feel offended and triggered by everything. But I'm just like, I, I, I felt like, I'm like, I'm like, like, what do you mean? I'm like going to rinse up my parents. I'm like, screw you. You know, it, it, initially you're kind of like, like, hang on, like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, no, that that's actually what I'm doing. You know? And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, this is, this is me. And, and, and it's so interesting, like in the world of social media, like you can either take it two ways. You can either be like, oh, screw him. Like he doesn't know what I'm talking about. And like, he's kind of calling out your insecurities of like what you're actually feeling, or you lean into it and understand like, yeah, why is that actually speaking to me? Like, how does he understand where I'm at? And like, that's the one thing about Gary that I've like resonated well with so much is that like, he's, he's able to understand where I'm at, where you are, and just be able to understand like, Hey, like I, I kind of know where your head's at with things, you know? And so that piece of content, like I said, hit me a ton, like a ton of bricks and I was faced with the decision. I'm like, okay, am I going to continue doing this or do I need to tell my father I can't do this anymore? And I went with the latter option and I had to tell my father, mind you, my father, who was an immigrant from Italy and he came over here to this country with $2,000 and made a life for himself and owns multiple businesses now. And like, I, I he has that entrepreneurial gene and I, I'm like, I, I, I can't displease him. Like that, that was always in the back of my head of like, I don't want to make him upset. And I also didn't want to resent him for the next 80 years of my life, the rest of my life, you know, however long I live. And so I had to tell him. And it was a weird two to three years after that, because it was always like, well, what are you gonna do now? Like, are you gonna like drop out of school now? Like, what's the point of us keeping you in school? Like, we're not gonna pay this money. And I was, you know, a communications major and I was trying to figure out like journalism and whatever. I didn't know what I was doing, but I'm like, I'm gonna figure it out. I'm like, if I don't figure it out after a year, I'm like, cool. Like, I'll, I'll leave school. Totally. Okay. Totally fair. And my time during that figuring it out was a complete low period that I hit in my life where I had no idea who I was anymore because for so long I was Enrico the doctor and now I'm not. Now when I see other people and now when I see my father's friends, it's like, Oh, how's the, how's the medical thing going? It's like, it's not. And it was a mind. It, it was just, it was, you know, for lack of a better term, it was a real mind fuck because I'm like, I don't know who I am, but I don't know, but I know what I don't want to be anymore. And that was key as well. And for those of you listening, when you understand what you don't want to be anymore, it makes it a lot more clear, even though you don't know yet what it is that you want to be, because it's kind of eliminating certain things and certain beliefs and certain identities that you don't want to attach yourself to any longer. And so those don't serve you and it will give you more clarity in the future, even though you don't see it yet on what you do want and who you want to become. And so during that time is, like I said, I hit a real low period of like, I, I just was not in a good headspace. And it was interesting. Cause like my girlfriend at the time too, like was in an, was in accounting and like, you know, she was going to be working at the prestige, like accounting firms in the city, like the top four in the country. And I'm like, what am I? Right. I'm like, who, who am I? Like, what's my identity? And I just went through a really dark time. And the reason I say that is because that was a time where I had attempted suicide and that's why I have this tattoo on my inner wrist that says Forza, which means strength in Italian, because it always reminds me of being strong and being just, j j just getting through the shit, right? And even though I don't know where I want to go, I know where I don't want to be. And I know that I can get through it no matter what, and I'll figure it out. And that's always been my motto. And that's always been my mantra moving forward with things. And so 
like I said, at that time I hit a low period, but I also found a new love for something and that was filming and that was videoing and that was giving tips. I had started on Snapchat by giving people tips on my cam on my phone of like, you know, fitness tips and whatever. And I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, like I said, my girlfriend at the time was like, why don't you make a YouTube channel on this? I'm like, great idea. And so I was working at my school's gym at the time and I went and bought myself my first GoPro. It was a GoPro camera like this. If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see my first ever video it was filmed on a GoPro. I think the first minute is me making oatmeal terrible, but nonetheless, it was a start and it was something that I wanted to lean more into and save that money at the gym. And I was starting to vlog myself, bought a new camera, nothing like I have now, but it was, it was a start for me. And it was something that I wanted to build upon. It was something that I was passionate about. It was something I was happy on. Like I would skip class to go take time lapses of the city for my freaking YouTube vlog that 20 people were going to watch. But it was because I loved it. It's because I'm like, I want to do this. I know what I don't want to do anymore. And I'm like, I love this thing. I love watching the people do this thing. And this is what I want to do. And so that's what I started doing more of. And it was funny. I bring up Christian Guzman again, because it was of March in 2017, I believe. He held a summer shredding competition. And that summer shredding competition was his first ever to where you would essentially go through a dieting phase for three months and like go through a transformation. At the end of it, you'd go to Houston, Texas to celebrate with everyone, meet up with everyone, work out, like, you know, summer shredding celebration in Houston. I did the whole thing, flew down to Houston and met everyone that I had, you know, followed on social media. It was like a surreal moment for me because like, these are my people, I feel like, you know, I, like I found my community, my online community. And at the time as well, I was following a man named Zach Rushlow, who was the flexible dieting on Instagram, the flexible dieting lifestyle on Instagram. It's funny. I was just connecting with Zach today again. And uh, Zach was there at the event and I introduced myself to him. I said, Hey man, like my name's Enrico. Like I love watching your content. He wasn't really huge yet on social media, but I'm like, I, I follow you and I like your content. He's like, cool, man. Like, I love that. And I appreciate it. Send me a DM and I'll send you a, a cookbook of mine, like a recipe book of mine of stuff. And uh, I'm like, awesome. So, you know, we connected and everything. And about a couple weeks later, I had to have surgery on my hip because I tore my hip labral, you know, a year and a half ago. So I had to get that done. Two weeks after my surgery, Zach put on his Instagram story that he was looking for a videographer to come with him to Los Angeles for five days. Mind you, this is Enrico, who has never had any experience really filming anyone but themselves, vlogging and just out of hip surgery in no place to even attempt doing this. I reached out saying like, hey, man, I'd love this opportunity. Like, I'm not as experienced, but I will. I, I'd, I'd love it. He's like, cool. It's like, why should I choose you over these other two people that are a lot more experienced than you? And I'm like, because I'll work harder than both of them. And he's like, OK. He's like, can you find your way to Los Angeles? I'm like, yep. So booked a flight two days later to Los Angeles. And I was walking around on crutches with like a hip brace on because I'm, I'm supposed to be, you know, healing and recovering and flew to LA filmed with Zach for five days and like met a bunch of cool people that I never thought I'd meet. And that turned into an opportunity to work with, to work for Zach for the next year. And I moved on from Chicago to Austin, Texas. I left school and everything and pursued that. And like at that time, I also met a man named Jordan Syatt who I knew as Gary Vaynerchuk's coach, not as Jordan Syatt. And that's a complete distinction now. But I met him at a Pencils of Promise event 2018 of January while I was working with Zach because we flew to LA again. Funny how like we actually flew to LA again. That's funny. But I, I introduced myself to him again and we just connected and everything. And after my year with Zach, I moved back home to Chicago because my time was, you know, complete there. Started doing some like freelance things on my own, you know, got a part-time job at Whole Foods. And like, I was trying to generate income. And it was just like, my time was up and I was trying to figure it out again. Right. It was that, that whole, like figuring it out theme. I've actually never said on a podcast before. Like that's one thing that I've actually always omitted is that after my time working with Zach and before working with Jordan, which I'll get into, I actually worked at whole foods for like six months. And that was a real ego thing for me is because I'm like, people know me as this. I don't ever want people to know me as Rico who had to fall back to go to working at whole foods. Right. And it, it felt like a real ego hit. So that was one thing that like, I've never actually said that like now I've publicly said, and it feels good to say it during my time working there, Jordan put on his Instagram story as well, that he was looking for a videographer. This was September now of 2018. I replied and I'm like, Hey man, I'd love this opportunity. Please let me know like what I need to do. He's like, Hey man, there's a person in front of you that I'm going to give them 90 days to try it out. If it does not work out, I will call you. I'm like, okay. So December 1st comes around. I'm on the Stairmaster at Lifetime Fitness, which is a gym in Chicago. And I get a call on my phone. It says Jordan Syed. And I'm like, 
the fuck's he calling me for? I'm like, why is he? I'm like, it's, it's 10 a.m. I'm like, what, what is he calling me for? I answered. He's like, hey, bro. I'm like, in, in, in a kind of confused, puzzled voice. I'm like, hey, man, mind you, I'm like, I'm like out of breath a little bit on the Stairmaster. He's like, are you working out right now? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, do you want me to call you back? I'm like, no. I'm like, let's tell him, let's talk. What's up? He's like, you want to move to New York City? I'm like, yep. He's like, he's like, dude, you like, you want to take like two to three days to think about it? I'm like, nope. I'm like, let's do it. And I actually ended up calling him back and we figured out all like the details and everything. But two weeks after that, I flew to New York City for the first time ever in my life and went to go film with him and his co-coach, Susan Niebergall, for their program. And uh, it was a surreal experience because I'd always heard about New York City, but I'd never seen it. And then two weeks after that, I moved my entire life to New York City from Chicago with just two suitcases into an apartment in Chinatown, Manhattan with six other roommates and uh, paid $1,100 for a for a cupboard under the staircase, Harry Potter type of room. But I was doing the damn thing. And I worked with Jordan for the next two years. I got to meet Gary Vaynerchuk, which was a really surreal moment for me because I'm like, you are the exact reason why I'm even here. And uh, it was just a really surreal moment that, but after my time working with Jordan after two years at the end of 2020, I'm now doing my own thing. And now I, you know, work with multiple Jordans like that for their social media to help them grow, build their audience. And that's what I do now. Sweet. And I mean, I had thought about just bypassing the origin story altogether because I've personally heard it, but then I thought there's so much value in my audience hearing it because there's a lot of takeaways and a lot of crossover that you might not have known about. First and foremost, I want to mention that back in 2019, I had Jordan Syed on the show. And I think that in his space, you might have been like, just like leaving or something. And he was, yeah. And then there's Rico back there. And so I was like, what are the odds that we would have this full circle moment that then I'd be having you on the show as well. And I like that about like all of the connections and crossovers that can happen in a career. And then the second piece is you had mentioned about the, the whole food situation. And that's kind of like, that's something I can really resonate with because like in my career, I have had lots of like little like hiccups and roadblocks and things that happened that I had no control of. Like, my first year as a trainer, the owners shut down the gym and went out of in-person business. And so I had to figure out something to do. I was like eight months in as a trainer and I wasn't getting enough hours. So I was working at a bar and I was doing as much odd jobs as I could. So I'd do like 6 a.m. sessions and I'd work till 3 a.m. at the bar and I'd have lots of energy drinks and coffee and I'd just make it work because I just wanted the dream to happen. And then when the pandemic came and gym shut down, Mm -hmm. I had two separate roles through Lululemon, one for four months, one for about five or six. And it's just like, that's sort of like the grit that it takes for people to like go from A to B. And we don't often talk about it, but I think it's important to, because if somebody is actually starting up and comes across this show, it's going to help them a lot more to hear other people talking about, yeah, like they did something to make it work because not everything always works out properly. And there's value in it too, because it gives you more people skills, gives you more exposure, gives you more just life skills. Like all that stuff plays into the overarching theme. And then I have one more, one more piece because you just, your origin story was so well constructed that it gave me so many nuggets to kind of like draw off of. So this other piece is just kind of about like finding your purpose, finding like who you want to be in your career. And that's something that I resonated with because like when I was in my like teens, I had one of those like tape video recorders Mm -hmm. and then it had like the, I think it was like a firewire cable that I could plug into my PC that I built myself. And so I'd make all these home videos And I was posting them on YouTube and things were going pretty good, but a lot of them are silly. So I've since taken them down, which sometimes I regret because like I have a video on YouTube that has like 10,000 views and most of my recent ones don't even have that many. And so I'm like, if I had kept them all up, you never know. It could have, it could have built up. But the point is that I had aspirations to go to film school. I was thinking I might go to Vancouver and currently I live in Edmonton. So that would mean moving to another province whole more expensive city, tuition expensive. And I was concerned that if I finished the program that I wouldn't get enough employment to pay off all the expenses and that I would Mm. be back and that I would have no future. And so then I went to university for general studies and tried to take more of a traditional path. And I chased sort of like the oil industry model of like doing something that's more like blue collar And then I had a quarter life crisis and realized that I wanted to do something that gave me a sense of purpose. 
took a great big leap into the fitness industry. And that's definitely something that's helped me a lot in my dark times is feeling that sense of purpose. So I just wanted to connect on that because I've definitely had my fair share of, of low moments where I've had to seek out therapy or where I've had to lean on friends and family or leverage like just training to get myself in the right headspace. So there's just a lot of important topics that you talked about. But, and, and, yeah. and, and that's funny you bring that up because my other tattoo that I have is literally the word purpose. And the reason I have that tattoo is because I'm a massive Justin Bieber fan. And his song Purpose on the Purpose album is my favorite song until the day I die. And it's just a song that's always resonated with me. And it's not just a song, but it's a word and it's a way of life. And I want to echo that from you as well. Well, I mean, while we're sharing tattoos, I got one too. So Nice. Um, that is- that's funny. I know that you can do the impossible. It's a Terry Fox quote. It's in like Elvish font. So I just got inspired by Lord of the Rings. Nice. Uh, The reason that I was drawn to that quote was because Terry Fox was somebody who ran across Canada on a one leg and, or at least made the attempt. Like he was battling cancer. He's one of Canada's sort of like heroes because he was out to raise funds to help more people live longer despite their fight battling cancer and he ended up dying in the process and i just thought to myself i'm like we make up so many excuses for ourselves to not be able to get from a to b yeah like we're constantly making up these stories in our head and i was like what if i have a moment of doubt how am i going to pull myself out of that so it was like when i was 17 to 18 i thought of this quote my parents are a little bit like anti-tattoo and so i got Mm -hmm. it written out on a banner on my wall and so I'd like look at the banner. I'm like, okay, if I'm okay with this banner for like my high school years, I'll be okay with it as a tattoo. Mm-hmm. So I got it as a tattoo and I was like 18 or 19 when I'd moved out. And like, it's served me very well in the fitness industry and just being a self-employed contractor and kind of like going the path that's less traveled. And then the other tattoo that kind of ties into purpose is I've got a turtle with the Hawaiian islands. Oh, wow. um, so the reason that I got that and sometimes like it can be a little bit cliche or some people might think like that's kind of a lame tattoo to get. But for me, that was during a time when my friends sur- who surrounded me had encouraged me to do something a bit outside of the box and just go camping with them in Hawaii. And we ended up doing that a few times. And it was just like, I couldn't quite afford the trip, but we made it work. We got a lot of like discounts and deals It was weird to think about going camping in a place like Hawaii, but then it really landed for me that life isn't about just like paying bills until you die, that we need to like stop, pause and collect moments and collect connection and really like take life in. So that's my tattoo share. (laughs) That's awesome. I love that. Thank you. So one of the things that I wanted to dive in while we're talking together is I just your presence within the media space. And if we were to specify one platform, I'd say YouTube, because personally I have a goal for YouTube. I want to kind of like hit the ground running with that, but it's something where I haven't had much momentum. So I'm curious to hear what, what your thoughts have been, where your successes have been, maybe some of your lessons. So one thing that I'll relate this to my time working with Jordan, because we went from like 10k on youtube that he had to like almost 200,000 in our time together and one thing that i think most people get wrong about youtube is when they go to make a video they don't see a return right away and they understand that there's a lot of work that has to go into it like the filming the editing the thumbnail like there's a lot of creation behind youtube that people don't really understand and you have to treat it as if it's a full-time job if you want it to be a full-time thing not necessarily that you want to only do youtube but like you know, a lot of people equate like, oh, I want to make income from YouTube. Cool. Like it's going to take you a long, like a long time to get there. And that's the one thing that I think most people burn out with is like, oh, I want to be a YouTuber. I want to make YouTube videos. I make one video and they quit. Cause like, it took me 27 hours to edit this thing. And I'm like, well, that's a territory that comes with. Right. But I think when it comes to YouTube, if you're someone who's actually serious about it, you're someone who's actually wanting to do it, make a video every single week or two a week for the next two to three years and don't expect a damn thing. Right? Because I look at it like this. If a weight loss client were to lose a pound a week, that's 52 pounds a year. It's great. 
In two years, that's 104 pounds. In two years, that's 104 videos. I think from you being zero to 104, you'll learn a lot more. And I think not only that, it's like, well, what, what kind of content do I make? What do I speak to? As long as you're following a who, what, where, I mean, a who, what, and why of like, who am I helping? What's the problem? And why should I care about this? You'll be golden. The other thing you need to think about too is in this day and age in 2023, there's a level of interest factor that needs to be extremely paid attention to in the sense of, is your thumbnail something that people want to actually click? Is your something is, is your title something that speaks to a problem? Is it something that creates a level of curiosity that is not seen before? Why should someone care about your video? There's so many other videos. I look at YouTube as like the grocery store, right? When you go to the grocery store, there's so many different types of cereal. Why do you pick out the one that you do? Maybe because you like it all the time because it's been consistently good. Like, but what gets you to try something new, right? Usually it's the box. It's the marketing. It's the, it's the packaging of it. It's the placement of it, wherever it is, right? I look at YouTube the exact same way. Like I always watch ESPN FC videos because I love soccer and I want to just stay up to date with that. I will never not watch them regardless of what it is, right? But Maybe it's going to take someone else to put a spin on another topic or a similar topic and have a different style of thumbnail or have a different title to get my attention. And now I'm invested in them, right? So that's how you have to look at YouTube is it's a long game. Yes, but you are fighting for people's attention all the time. And the other thing too with YouTube is it's the second highest search engine in the world to Google. And oh, by the way, Google owns YouTube. So you can play to search. You can play to SEO. Like, yes, it still has a, it still has power. But what has power now is I think showing, and there, there's a few things, showing a how I versus a how to do something, right? And I think too many people are focused on the, oh, here's how to do this. Here's how to do that. Here's how to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the form in which it's shifting to is a how I, because in a world where we've gone more digital, we've gone more work from home, we're more curious about the individual. We're more curious about each person, how they live their day-to-day, -day, how they just exist in this world now, right? And showing how I do something is a lot more different than how to do something. And I think a lot of people need to lean more into that. What do I mean by that? Let's look at the Jordan Syatt video we did with the, the Big Mac challenge, the one that got us a lot of notoriety where it's like he ate a Big Mac every single day for 30 days, right? And lost seven pounds. If he were to show you how to eat a Big Mac every day for 30 days and lose seven pounds, it's different versus how he does it because his life is different than yours, right? He had a wedding on day 23 or of it or something. And like, I, was, I wasn't even there then, I was away. But it's like, oh my gosh, like how is he going to, how is he gonna fit this in? And like, we were texting. He's like, hey man, do you want me to like send you a clip of this? Like, how should I eat this? I'm like, yeah, just like film yourself in the car. Like, but just show that you have the burger, right? And like, we filmed each, like I filmed him all the way up until like day, you know, 16, 17. Like there were times where I couldn't, but it was just the fact of like, he's got to do it, but like, how's he going to do it? And it's like, there's life things that happen, right? He's going to jujitsu class. He's going to, he's going to eat one beforehand after, like he's got to work out. Like what's that all like? Right. And so showing how you do something, letting people more into your life. And by the way, doing 30 day challenges crush, taking people from point A to point B and a certain starting point, leaving the end, a highly questionable ending creates a certain level of intrigue that can't be matched because a lot of people want to be able to see, okay, here you are now, but are you actually going to do this? Right? The, the Big Mac challenge, I ate Big Mac every day for 30 days and lost seven pounds. You want to know how the hell did you lose seven pounds eating a Big Mac every day for 30 days, right? It creates that level of interest. It creates that level of intrigue with that. Also, I think a lot of people get wrong not only like the 30 day challenges, but there's two metrics that people need to care more about. And that's the click through rate, meaning how often are people likely to click on your video and the average view duration, right? You need to keep people on your video. It's the same, it's the same principles that I, that I speak about with TikTok or Instagram, any social platform. It's cool. Can you hook people in amazing, but are you giving them enough of a reason to stay? And oh, by the way, with YouTube, getting a YouTube subscriber is a lot harder to do than getting someone to click follow on Instagram. You have to earn that. Like earning someone's subscribe on YouTube is a lot harder than what it seems. And so I think a lot of people need to put more effort into their videos instead of just making like these random videos and, you know, care less about it. The actual content itself needs to be good. You can have a great thumbnail. You can have a phenomenal title. You can tag it. You can SEO it really well. If the actual content within the video isn't good, it won't do well. And YouTube cares more about how often or how long you are staying on someone's video because it'll get it pushed out more. It'll put it more in front of, it'll put it in front of the right eyes. Algorithms are smart. 
the algorithm knows exactly what you like. That's why when you're on Instagram and TikTok, you see a lot of the same videos that you're like, I, like, I don't even follow these people. But why is it showing me? Because you've interacted with similar videos like that. And it's trying to gauge, okay, do you like this? Should we show you more of it or not? Right. And so that's the thing that you have to think about is what is the end consumer at the end of the day, what this all boils down to anything with content, it's human psychology and behavior, mm -hmm. all of it. I think the takeaway that I liked the most was making it about how a person does it rather than how anybody does it, like personifying it because it's true. That makes a huge difference. Like mm -hmm. I'd rather know why you collect Oreos than why just anybody collects Oreos, which is a great segue. So let's, let's talk a bit about more about that. Yeah. And there's a great story behind that. So when I worked with Zach, a lot of his recipes were using Oreos and he had a, he had a collection of them in, in the house that we lived in. Cause we lived in an apartment together in Austin and he had like fruity pebble Oreos. He had like these Coca-Cola ones that like aren't made anymore and they were all limited edition. And so I started collecting them cause I'm like, I want this and there's a market for this stuff, believe it or not. And I have an entire freezer, two freezers almost at my father's house where I just store all these and they're all, I, I buy two packages every single time. So if you're wondering like, well, how do you keep up to date with like, you know, when Oreos are getting dropped? Cause I follow accounts that keep up to date on Oreos, <laughs> but also whenever I go to the grocery store, I will make it a non-negotiable that I always have to go to the Oreo, Oreo aisle to just see if there's anything new that I haven't gotten yet. And I don't collect the golden regular ones, the double stuff, like the, the regular Oreos or the mint. Like those are always around. I collect only limited edition ones. I, only, I always get two back, two packages. The reason I get two is because one is in case I want to eat it. And the other one is that is a mandatory save. 98% of them, except for my grandmother in Italy when she came over to visit, was hungry and accidentally opened one. And I had almost a conniption because she didn't know better. And my dad's like, by the way, your grandmother... No, 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 not in Italian. In, in Italian, she's like, no, I ate a, an Oreo of yours, and I'm like, it's fine. And otherwise, they stay unopened. And if someone's asked, like, what's the goal with that? I just want to collect them. I don't have any intent on selling them anytime soon. I want to collect them for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I want to have them when my kids are around. I want my kids to start collecting them. I, if my kids are out and about, get dad some Oreos because we're going to collect those. It's more of a hobby and a passion of mine. And I also collect like sports cars as well. Like those are things that I enjoy collecting because. I'm a big fan of like compounding interest of like, I just want to hold on to things and then let go of it later, or maybe even not. Right. Like I have a package of game of throne Oreos that would go for $40 each right now. And I'm going to hold on to those. Like, I'm not going to get rid of those. Like when the show maybe doesn't, you know, go anymore, like all the game of thrones assets are going to be valuable. Right. There's like lady Gaga Oreos that I have. I think I have like 10, 15 packages of those because I know she's a figure. And so I know figures specifically would probably go for more because that's the person rather than like the show. I'm hoping they make Stranger Things Oreos because I think that would be a really valuable asset. That's something that I, I'm really interested in. If you're going to ask me what my favorite Oreo is, I will tell you I have three of them. One, it's the white fudge Oreo, which comes around seasonally for winter time. And that is one of the best Oreos possible. If you have like hot tea, coffee with that. It is phenomenal. Freeze them and they're great. The second best one, in my opinion, I just love the stuff inside of it. Like the stuffing, the cream, it's called the most stuff. And it is, it is a thick or it is like a double stuff Oreo with a little bit of steroids in it. That's how like thick it is. And I love it. The third one, it's a tie between. So I have had like the fruity pebbles Oreos, which is really, really good. It's a tie between that one I also love the, like, it's like a Pop Rocks one. It has a little bit of Pop Rocks in the middle just because it's an interesting, I'm so fascinated by how they did that. So it's between those two. And then also I, I actually have like a red, so like the, the brand Supreme, I have like a, a packet of three red Supreme Oreos that I bought for $20 on eBay. And I don't plan on selling those anytime soon, but that's my Oreo collection in a nutshell. Love it. And I like that you mentioned the Pop Rocks one because I just, bought those like a few years ago without even realizing that that's what they were and nice was, i was in for quite the shock because i was just sitting there eating oreo and all of a sudden pop rock sensation and just completely caught off guard even that you've been collecting them for so long i'm curious to know are there any flavor of oreos that you associate with like a really big memory either good or bad just because of the time in your life Ooh. when you bought them Man, that's a great question. Wow. It's interesting because I like I, I have Oreos in my apartment right now and every time I've always like collected them, 
whenever I go back home to Chicago, I bring a suitcase just for them. <laughs> like I've actually had them like check, like they've had to swab them at like TSA at the airport and everything. Cause they're like, what are you bringing orders for? I'm like, cause I collect them and uh, I bring them home every single time. So there, it, it's never been like I've bought an Oreo and of like I've attached it to like a certain feeling or memory or anything, but that's like a really, really good question. I can't confidently answer that. Like I'm trying to think, I'm literally, the reason I'm like looking off, cause I'm trying to think of like any Oreos that I have in my freezer that I attach to. I do know one thing for, for certain is I do that with music. Like I do that with songs mm -hmm. and I can vividly like on my Spotify playlist, I know when I go through a period of just like adding songs and I'm like, oh, yep, this is when I was like in college. This is when I like started working out more in college, like this, like this section. And I vividly like, I, I picture myself like working out at my gym again or like walking to classes, working in New York City. And like, I, I can see like the growth and like my taste of music and like how it's transitioned. Like when I got on a country kick and like I associate music with more so times and places with like how I felt and just kind of like my, my energy, like when I, you know, really love Justin Bieber and, you know, then he came out with a new album. Album and I can I can associate music to more of a feeling, but no, I can't say I have I can echo the same about uh, Oreos though. I mean, I'm glad that you brought up music because that was top of mind for me. I was driving in my car and I was like reflecting on my liked songs on Spotify, and if I go into like the 2022 in review or 2021 in review, yes. it's kind of funny because like there's like five songs that I play like obsessively for certain years and like they change and they evolve, but it's just like, I totally associate certain songs with like different moments in my career, or different emotions and stuff like that. So with that said, do you have a song that you associate with your time when you got to meet Gary Vaynerchuk being that he was so influential on, on your career path? Yes, absolutely. Hang on. I'm going to pull up the song because it's actually, it was, it used to be the intro of his daily V and I've always associated that with him. I'm trying to think of the name of the song. I want to like, I want to actually get it. I think it's, I think it's this one. I'm trying to see if it's this. One. The legend, the score. No, that's not it, man. I, I, I gotta get the name for you, but I know the intro, like the, the, the daily V used to be like, like now we're going to be legends, like going to get their attention. Yeah. Like what we're doing here ain't just scary. It's about to be legend. Le I think legendary. I think that's the name of the yeah. song. Cause I was looking up like legends on Spotify. I think it's legendary. Um, man, I'm blanking right now. I totally recognize the song you're talking yes. about. So like that, that sticks. I saw that in a Netflix movie this past uh, fall or something like that. And I was, Ooh, man, this, this hits. Yes. And, and and that's the one that I like because like when I was consuming Gary at the time with like the daily V's, it just the the energy of the song I felt matched him, but also like in like New York City where is where he lives. And I'm like, it's a perfect mm -hmm. song because I'm like, I like like it, it, I don't know why. It's just you just want to go get it. Like whatever it is. Like you want to just like go crush your workout, like go do the damn thing, whatever, like go I don't know what you whatever you want to do, go make a sale, go crush your business, go make content, like whatever it is. You just want to go do it, you know? Definitely. So as we're going into like 2023, you're at the start of the year. Like, what are your aspirations for yourself? Like we unpacked your origin story. We've unpacked so many things that you've done, but like, what's your big picture plan for you? Big picture plan. I would say in the next, mm, I don't like to give myself timelines. It's interesting. Cause like, if you would ask me five years ago when I was 22, I couldn't tell you I was here. So it's always changing, but it's always like on the horizon of things. I want to remove myself from solely filming and editing people. And I want to help them with their strategy on social because I understand this really well and I study it every single day. I want to hire out a full media team to be able to go do that for me. Um, I want to be able to continue to grow people's brands, their audience, and I want to be able to have a full scale like media team, not necessarily solely like a media agency yet that could be on the horizon, but that is a goal of mine. I want to do a lot more speaking events, speaking engagements. I want to solidify myself as a figure, not only on social media, but in the world of content, getting out of your own way, making videos, being comfortable in front of the camera. Like I want to be the guy this year, next year, and you know, foreseeable future, I'm going to go harder on long form content. So YouTube, like I want to grow my presence there. I, I want to keep doing what I'm doing and I've been gaining a lot of momentum lately, specifically on like Instagram. Like I've tripled my audience in the past month, which has been, a, I'm so grateful for that because it's, it took me 
all of 2021 losing people and 2022 a little bit to clarify my message. And now I've been able to do that. And it's like, that's a reward for me that I want to continue to capitalize on, but also never forget like where I started and continue to be grateful for that. So it's almost just compounding on top of that and just continuing to build my presence on social while helping larger businesses, not just in the fitness space, but anyone and every anyone and everyone that I can see myself associating the concepts, the strategies that I have into the vertical that they have, whether it's the real estate space, um, housing or financial, wherever that is. But like, I know I can help other people in other realms. And so that's my goal is to not leave the fitness space because that's a space that I love, but it's like, I want to, I, I want to cement my roots in that fitness space, but then also branch out. And so that's essentially like the next, you know, Couple, honestly, I, I think I could do that in a couple of years. Five years from now, I said I'd like to get married, you know, s- start a family, have a wonderful house. So I think it's just stuff like that, you know, in terms of personal goals, not just, you know, social and business wise, but yeah. Yeah, totally makes sense. And I mean, you even answered like the, the personal side of the question because I'm like, what about the non work version? Yeah. And you addressed that, which was important. This next question is going to be hard hitting, it might be tough to answer. But I often like to think about this because like oftentimes as people sort of like rise in their popularity, like life doesn't change. Life still has its obstacles and its challenges. Mm -hmm. So in a general sense, in a career sense, in a life sense, what is it in your life at this present moment that drives you to not quit when it gets tough? Oh, I love that. My answer is, oh, so I I wish I, I wish... Wish I read the tweet. I had the tweet yesterday that I saw and there was a perfect answer to this question. It's the absence that I feel when I'm not consistent, right? In a sense of like, I, I like what what drives me is knowing that like every single day I have to just like, I I built so much momentum and like the, the fear of like not feeling that level of consistency, like is just, it's daunting to me. And the same thing with like my fitness and like working out, like I'm in, I'm in such a good headspace, like my, my nutrition and everything. But like, I know the goal with that. I know the goal with like my workouts and same thing with like my social media. And it's just like, I, 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 I know that if I don't show up that that's my fucking fault and I'm being selfish for that because I'm choosing to not help someone that day. And I wish I had that tweet in front of you, like I said, because it was like, be, be like, become so consistent that like the thought of, or like the absence of being consistent, like leaves you empty. And that's how I feel. Like if I don't mm-hmm. post a video or if I don't post something and I know people are gonna be like, oh, like social media, it's so stupid. Like I actually have to go to work. It's like, okay, cool. But like, fuck off, Bill, right? It's like, th- like this is my work. This is my job. This is what I do. And like, this is my, this is my art. And uh, for me, it's like the absence of that is, it, it is what it is. It's just, I, I feel empty. And I, I, I feel like it's just not, it doesn't make me whole. And I think what I've been doing, what I've done a great job at and like what I love is that like I'm not attached to any result. It's not like, oh, I'm going to hit 100,000 on this platform and then I'm going to cash in. I think too many people focus on that. Too many people focus on like, oh, I just, I just want to get 10,000 followers on Instagram. For what? I just want to get 100,000 on YouTube. For what? Right? Like, because you want to cash in on your audience. Like, I never want to do that. And like, I think it's it's rewarded me in the, in the end because it's like I've never had to ask for a sale or at, like push anything. Like, I've gotten a lot of inquiries and people wanting to work with me because of it. And I'm blessed for that. And I'm grateful for that. And so it's like, I want to stay true to all, all of that. And like, I've never had an issue with ever needing to, oh, I have to make sure I stay true to it. It's like, cause if you have to make sure you're staying true to it, like you weren't fucking true to it in the beginning. Like it's because you're getting distracted. It's because you have all these temptations and it's like, I don't know. I've, I've just always looked at like, I want to make the next piece of content better than it was the last time. I want to help one more person. I want to help two people this time, three people, whatever it is. And it's just like, I'm attached to the habits and the process of all of it. It's much like a client that's like, oh, I want to lose 30 pounds. Cool. For what? When you get there and then like what? You want to look good for so-and-so at work so you can show off to them? And then what? You're going to be happy after that? No, because all you care about is that result. Instead of like, no, I want to lose the 30 pounds because I want to be here for my kids in five years. Otherwise, if not, I'm going to be fucking six feet under, right? That's Mm -hmm. different. That's a different purpose. That's a different result. Like that's a different process that you're buying into. And so I think a lot of people need to look at life like that. Whatever they do is like, why are you actually doing this? Stop attaching to the outcome. Stop attaching to the result. Attach yourself to the habits and the outcome, the habits and the actions that a person who is achieving that result would be doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And what has really helped me understand what you're saying with that is I've recently taken an interest in jujitsu. I've been influenced by a lot of my friends in the industry and I've been doing that since October 
And just in doing that action of going in there and improving and honing a skill without really worrying, like, I don't care if it takes me five years to get a blue belt. Like, that's fine. Yeah. I go there and like people are invested in helping me and helping me improve and I'm getting a clear headspace. Like there can be water coming out of the walls and I'll just go to jujitsu and I forget all about it. And I think that's an important takeaway for anybody because like with this podcast, I've published between 200 and 300 episodes. I've stopped numbering them. I went through a phase where I did an episode every day for like five or six months. And then I took those down, but I've put in the reps with it. And it's the journey that is the most rewarding. It's not so much that I want to be the next Joe Rogan or something like that. It's more so that I get this privilege to be able to connect and learn and get better each time. Like I make mistakes. I learn technical things, but it's just hopefully people understand to make sure that they're intentional in the things that they're doing day to day and not get so obsessed in that outcome at the end. Yep. Amen. And with that said, I want to make sure that people do know how to track you down. I'm sure they can find you, but what are your go-to ways for them to find you if they don't know where? Yeah. Instagram's a great place. It's just rico.incarnati. If you are someone that wants to get better making videos, I have an entirely free Facebook group. It's called video content made simple social media literally anything. There's all walks of life and they're not just fitness coaches. There are a ton of fitness coaches. Um, that's a great group community for you to be a part of as well. Absolutely. And I can say for a fact that like I have joined the group myself so I can vet it. It's a good one. Good, good vibes. So that'll be in the show notes as well, just so that people have easy access to find it. But with that said, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, Chris, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.